Well, welcome to CBN News. My name is Dan Andros, joined today by Chuck Holton, who is in Israel. We have a massive terror attack that happened in Russia. A lot of questions on this one, uh, given the circumstances here, an attack in Russia. It just, a lot of questions, Chuck, so we have a lot to get into. So why don't you go ahead and just dive right in? What are your first reactions to this? Uh, well, I mean, everybody is immediately thinking about the war that Russia is waging on Ukraine, and Ukraine has been striking deep into Russia with drones and even with some troops lately, uh, some Russian troops that are actually friendly to Ukraine uh, that are on fighting on Ukraine's side have moved, uh, ha done some operations not deep into Russia, but into Russia, and that's the first time that's really happened. Uh, since the war started. So a lot of people immediately thought, oh, that Ukraine must have done that. But but the difference is Ukraine has never specifically targeted civilians. Uh, in, in this conflict, Ukraine has always limited it itself to military targets. And so that really kind of makes it feel like this probably isn't Ukraine. Well, then after the attacks happened, uh, they've arrested 11 people and four of them, they say, were actual attackers uh, that took place, took, took part in the attacks. And they, they're not Ukrainian. They're Muslim. They're like Tajik. And they're fr from one of the many minorities in Russia. So, and they say that they were actually paid to carry out these attacks. Now, we don't know exactly paid by whom, but um, that, that's what they're saying. And what, what, it really sounds like it because ISIS uh, in on their telegram channels is claiming responsibility for these attacks. And it very well uh, could be ISIS. I mean, there's there's not really much reason to think that it isn't if if ISIS is claiming the attacks and even has been putting out photographs of the attackers wearing the same clothing before the attack, uh, then it very likely is ISIS, and it doesn't have anything to do with Ukraine. Russia, for its part, really wants it to have something to do with Ukraine so that it can continue to whip up fervor against Ukraine in and among its own people. But it looks to, from, from all the evidence that's come out so far, more than 100 people dead, hundreds of people wounded, uh, it looks like this is a, an ISIS attack in Russia. What, Chuck, I mean, this is just... What possible motivation would ISIS have for doing this? You're seeing footage of this now that's been uh, hitting the internet. And as you said, over 130 so far are dead. And essentially what happened is here is you had a popular concert venue uh, near Moscow and these ISIS allegedly terrorists uh, stormed in there with guns and incendiary devices and threw them uh, into the crowd. And so you had all this chaos. So. What would be the possible motivation here for ISIS, Chuck? Well, ISIS-K specifically is trying to make a comeback. Now, ISIS-K is uh, the the sort of uh, kind of the, the ISIS team that's in Afghanistan, okay? Uh, so it's a subsidiary of, of ISIS, and they're, they've been growing in Afghanistan uh, since about 2015. They have over 6,000 fighters, they claim. And they say that, uh, I mean, the, they mean to take back uh, Afghanistan from the Taliban. So the Taliban, believe it or not, are not extreme enough for ISIS Khorasan. And so ISIS at, was fighting against the United States when we were there. And once the United States pulled out, they turned their attention to the Taliban. And they've been waging a pretty protracted war against the Taliban in Afghanistan. But they haven't stopped there. They have been expanding their operations uh, over the past year. Uh, they, first of all, this is the group of ISIS fighters that is responsible for killing 13 Americans in 2021 mm. as the United States was pulling out of Kabul, okay? So keep that in mind. Uh, now, they have also been uh, responsible for some attacks in Tajikistan, some attacks in Pakistan, just across their border, and some attacks even in Iran earlier this year, in January of this year, there was a large attack that killed 94 people at a um, 
kind of a graveside service remembering Qasem Soleimani uh, in Iran. And the United States actually warned Iran it was going to happen, and Iran didn't listen. In the same way, the United States had been warning Russia for some time, for the last couple of weeks, that there was going to be a terror attack on a large group of people, probably a concert somewhere near Moscow, uh, coming up soon. And they even, the, the American embassy in Moscow warned any American citizens who happen to be living there not to go to any concerts in the near future because there was about to be an attack. So the United States has some pretty good intel uh, on ISIS-K, and that probably comes from how much time we spent in uh, Afghanistan, and we still have assets there, and some of those assets have probably wormed their way into ISIS-K. But suffice it to say, ISIS Khorasan is looking to expand its operations to become the big man on the block among terror organizations because what happens is when they make a high profile attack like this it draws all of the the bad guys to them everybody want they, they become the new cool kids on the block in the the terrorism world and everybody wants to become a part of them and they gain power so this is why they would do this and uh, choosing to do it in Russia uh, in the the statement that they put out after the attacks, ISIS said that they were actually looking to kill Christians, uh, and they claim to have killed more than 300 Christians. We don't know exactly how many will have died by the time all the bodies are counted. Uh, it's still pretty chaotic there, but uh, they they were looking to kill Christians. They consider, I mean, look, Russia, uh, Vladimir Putin. Uh, Russian president has been claiming that Russia is a Christian country, uh, trying to set himself apart from uh, Ukraine and, and claiming Ukraine Ukrainians are the uh, the apostates and Russians are the two Christians and things like that. Of course, you know anybody that's ever picked up a Bible knows that uh, Vladimir Putin is not a Christian in any way, shape, or form, uh, just by his fruits. But that is what would be the motivation for ISIS K to pull off an event like this. All right, if you're just joining us, Dan Andros here with CBN's Chuck Holton, who's in Israel. We are talking about this terror attack that just happened in Russia, where ISIS, who's taking claim for this terrorist attack, uh, unloaded on a concert, popular concert venue. And of course, it's echoes of Israel I and mean, similar, similar type attack, right? Except one indoors, one outdoors, but uh, just innocent civilians there enjoying a concert. And then you have this carnage going on, and it's just, it's it's shocking to see this again. I mean, is this something, Chuck, right now where can we ex expect, you, you talked about why they'd want to do it in the first place. Can we expect more of these? I mean, is there is there immediate danger for more, or what does it take for them to pull something off like this, and can we expect to see another one? We can certainly expect to see more of these, without a doubt. Now, they do take some time to plan, and uh, I mean, this one probably was in the planning stages for six months to two years even. Uh, and again, if ISIS is looking to make a comeback, and we know that they are, uh, the, the Biden administration, Anthony Blinken has talked about it uh, in Syria. Uh, look, when I was in Syria last, uh, there's a, a camp there in, uh, it's called al Hol Camp, that had 10,000 ISIS families in it. And the the Kurds, uh, in the, the Syrian Kurds, uh, were in charge of guarding this camp. But it's very, very hard to guard a camp of 10,000 people. And there was literally no plan to ever let them out of the camp. It's like, how do you, what do you do with these people? You can't just line them up all uh, against the wall and shoot them. Uh, these are women and children, and, and, and some of the children are military-age males now. They've been there for, you know, six, seven years even. And so uh, they, they don't really know what to do with them. They desperately need the United States to have a presence there to back up the Kurds. And the reason the United States has 40,000 troops across the Middle East in bases in uh, Syria and in Iraq and in Jordan and in Qatar and you know all over the place, even in Israel, is because we know that now we don't like to say it. The United States military doesn't like to say it out loud, but we know that ISIS never actually was defeated. They were tamped down enough 
so that we could kind of move on to other things and, and so that the American electorate would forget about them. But they have been stewing and plotting their return ever since they were defeated back in, uh, what, 2019, okay? So uh, they desperately want to be, uh, again, a world uh, transnational terror organization once again. And they have, um, you know, sort of subsidiaries in Afghanistan, in Libya, in uh, Nigeria, in Niger, in Mali, and, you know, lots of places across Africa and in the Philippines and you, you name it. There, there are small groups of these uh, ISIS fighters all across the Middle East, Africa, and even into Asia. And so uh, not only that, but there have been millions of people from those areas that have been streaming into Europe and even into the United States through the Darien Gap and everything. We've been doing a lot of reporting on that. And so there's a very good chance that there are fighters uh, that have been planning attacks like this. Uh, we call them large multi-cell, uh, massive multi-cell terror attacks, uh, MMTAs. Uh, and uh, they, they have likely been planning these things for years, and they have a plan to carry them out in the United States, in Europe. Uh, we see them from time to time in Europe already, and this is just uh, yet another one. And so it just proves that ISIS is might have been down, but they're certainly not out. I think this really highlights Chuck. The, by the way, Dan Andros here. Chuck Holner, I see more people keep coming into the stream. We welcome you in. Chuck is in Israel right now, and we are reacting to this terrorist attack uh, in Russia. If you have a question for Chuck, by the way, please leave it in the comments. We are uh, monitoring that. We'll try to we'll try to grab those uh, for you. But this really highlights, Chuck, I think the border issue that we're dealing with here in America, because the, the ease of which uh, people can get into America right now. And then on top of that, you have groups like this who clearly just want to, as you were explaining, do these mass scale attacks on civilians. Man, this is uh, it was a recipe for disaster here right now in America. Well, I mean, I think this is indicative, indicative of a kind of a self inflicted problem by the United States. Uh, uh, you know, we we pulled out of Iraq without defeating Afghanistan. We, I, I'm sorry, without defeating uh, Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda turned into ISIS. Uh, we pulled out of Afghanistan without defeating the Taliban or ISIS. And, uh, you know, you cannot end a war by just deciding you're done fighting. That's called losing. <laughs> there's There's no other way to say it. That's called losing because if the enemy is not done fighting, if you haven't broken his will and you just say, okay, we're done fighting now, the war's over, then you just lost the war. And there's a very good lesson in that for the United States as we look at you know, what, we, what we've done in Ukraine. I mean, in for a penny, in for a pound. If we've already invested $70 billion or $100 billion in Ukraine, if we just walk away from it right now, we are committing another error like we did in Afghanistan. And those things don't exist in a vacuum. They will come back and bite us later on, just like we're seeing right now. So uh, because we did not have the political will to finish the fight in Afghanistan, we always said this was gonna happen. I mean, I remember saying this at the beginning of the war in Afghanistan 20 years ago, that if we don't finish this fight in Afghanistan, we're gonna have to finish it in the United States of America. And that's exactly what we may be seeing at some point in the near future in the US. Now, I've been uh, reporting on the entire pipeline of illegal immigration, all the way from Chile and Ecuador and Brazil, all the way up into the United States. and. If you go to the, Pan the, the, the Darien Gap between Colombia and Panama, you will see, even right this minute, there are literally thousands of people every day coming through that choke point from all over the world. These are not people, by and large, from Ecuador or from Colombia. There are a lot of Venezuelans in there, but that isn't necessarily very comforting because a lot of the Venezuelans coming through belong to this train de la, la, de la Aragua gang, which is worse than MS-13, that are now streaming up into the United States and forming crime gangs 
in the U.S. We're seeing it in New York. We're seeing it in Miami. We're seeing it in Los Angeles and other cities around the United States. Uh, but in addition to the Venezuelan criminals that are coming up, you've got people from Nigeria, from Mali, from Gabon, from Cameroon, from Somalia, from Sudan. You, I mean, I could go on and on. Many people from Afghanistan, without a doubt, people from India and all over. So uh, we are undoubtedly importing the next terror attacks that we will see in the United States right this minute. It's happening every single day coming through the Darien Gap. And we we know that for a fact because we they just recently, what, last week, uh, captured a guy in the United States who had come through the Darien Gap and uh, he he admitted to being a Hezbollah operative that had come to the United States specifically to 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 perform terror attacks in the United States and was caught before he could do it. The question is, if we caught him, how many people did we not catch? Right. Yeah. yeah. And uh, just to play devil's advocate here, and I saw a user named Blue Dino there in the chat kind of echoing this. You talk about we've we've got to fight these things to win, right? You can't get out of there early. It's losing and uh, all all valid points, of course. Just to play devil's advocate, how do you stop or how do you know when you've won against something like an ISIS, which is, you know, you can keep stamping them out and they come back like ants, right? They just keep coming back and coming back. How do you how do you know when you've when you've won that? The reason that ISIS has not been a major player on the world stage for the last several years is because we did hit them hard enough to put them back into their holes in the ground for a time. Now, you're never going to completely uh, you know, dismantle evil uh, short of Jesus coming back, but uh, this is what you have to understand. You, you need to understand the culture that these people come from, that these terrorists exist in. They, first of all, they don't exist in a civilized world. And so if you try to, here I am, this got, the, I've got them. <laughs> Do you see that? Uh, uh, the reactions on my phone apparently are turned on because I make a thumbs up and it, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> um, but they, they don't come from a civilized world. So if you try to uh, reason with them, it's not going to work. I've heard, you know, Marie Harf once famously said that these guys just wouldn't be terrorists if we would just give them jobs. Well, that's not how it works in their culture. They don't come from a civilized world. They're not looking for a job. They're looking to kill us. And for them, it's a religious, it's an ideological issue. It's all about dying the right way. Rather than, you know, for Christians, for us, all the dying was done 2,000 years ago, very close to where I'm standing. I'm here on the shores of the Sea of Galilee tonight. Um, but all the dying was done by Christ 2,000 years ago for us but not for these radical Muslims. They have to die fighting the infidel in order to be guaranteed a slot in paradise. And so the, the, the culture here in the Middle East and, and in other uncivilized countries around the world is a culture that understands one thing and one thing only, and that is brute force. They understand strength. OK, and so you cannot reason with them. You cannot give them a job and get them to stop. The only thing you can do is crush them so hard that they beg for mercy, that they that they beg you to stop. And then they will respect you, at least for a time. They will retreat. They will lick their wounds and they'll start planning in the next time uh, that they want to they want to hit you. But it's got to be through brute force. And we did that. In 2019, the whole world came together to crush the ISIS caliphate that they had started putting together in late 2014, and, and it worked. It, it cost 70,000 Iraqi soldiers lives to, to crush them, and about 12,000 Kurds had to die uh, for that. Uh, but the United States, Turkey, Russia, Syria, uh, Iraq, I mean, even, I mean, everybody just join the fight against ISIS and just ground them to powder. And for a time, that gave us a respite. And we didn't have to worry about uh, radical Islamic terror for a while. But it's never going to be completely gone because you can't wipe out radical Islam. Uh, 
uh, and that's just that's just the way it is. Uh, but the the idea that we are now pushing on Israel that oh you know look if you would just reason with these people in Gaza uh, they they won't bother you anymore. You just have to be nicer to them. No, that's not how it works in their culture. They only the, it, any kind of reasonableness is seen by them as weakness. And so if Israel follows the advice of the United States and doesn't go into Rafa and starts trying to negotiate by giving up thousands and thousands of known terrorists and murderers in order to get back their hundred uh, or so uh, remaining hostages, that will be seen as an act of weakness all across the Middle East. And it will only put Israel in the um, the very unenviable position of having another October 7th attack at some point in the future. Now, that brings us back around to Russia. And the question is, uh, first of all, why would they do this in Russia? Well, uh, they they did it in Russia because they could do it in Russia. Uh, they there it's one of those Mount Everest questions. You know, they, they did it because it was there. Um, they have Russia has actually been taking a lot of migrants uh, lately. They've been one of the largest recipients of migrants, uh, and that doesn't make a lot of news. But they also remember Russia is not just Russians. It's made up of lots and lots of different people groups, some of which are radical Muslims. The Chechens especially are famous for being absolutely brutal radical Muslims. And Russia harness that at the beginning of the war with Ukraine by sending Chechen troops into Ukraine to absolutely, you know, just brutalize uh, civilians in places like Irpin and Bucha and other places as well. Uh, but now, and and this is not the first time this has happened. If you remember the, uh, 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 there was a movie theater attack uh, back in the 90s, I believe, where they had hundreds of people killed. That was, again, a radical Islamic terror attack. They had the um, school attack, and I forget the name of the school offhand, uh, but they they went in and took over a school and absolutely just brutalized the children in that school. And, and hundreds of them, I think like 300 children died in that school. So Russia is not has never been immune to radical Islamic terror attacks, right? Uh, and so it's not a surprise that this would happen there now. Yeah. And to. Oh, to ben, your, thank you, ben Belson. Yeah. Yeah. And and to your point about reasoning, and there's no reasoning with this, it's it really flies in the face of all logic at, at all to say when you watch something like an October 7th or watch something like this and you go, you know what? What are I wonder what they're trying to say? <laughs> you know, Let's talk to them and find out what they it makes no sense. I mean, they're doing things like killing elderly, killing babies, killing mm -hmm. uh, just people who are watching right. a concert. Like this is, you know, bottom of the depths evil. And like you said, there there is no reasoning with it. You just have to stamp it out as best you can. And the whole globe should be united in that. And, right. and this time you know, it's aimed it, at- It says something to me that even though the United States is really strongly at odds with Russia right now, we had the decency to call them and tell them, hey, you're about to have a big terror attack. You might want to do something about that. And what did Vladimir Putin do? He said, oh, this is just America trying to, you know, scare us. You know, we're not going to be scared and everything. And guess what? Now they're paying the price for that. Yeah. And I mean, and look, and Putin, obviously, we know, I mean, this is after their election here and he had, what, 80 some percent of the vote. Election. Clearly, <laughs> yeah, the, the election. Right. Free and fair elections there in uh, good old Russia. So, yeah, no, it's um, so I guess he's not too worried about political appearances is all I was uh, saying by bringing that up. But but how how can we expect this to be seen spun by the various uh, players that are related. I mean, Ukraine, like you said earlier in this live stream, Chuck, that Ukraine, Russia wants this to be like be put mm -hmm. on Ukraine, right? Like in the midst of everything right. they got going on there. What can we expect to see from these different countries about this attack? Well, you know, the standard politician playbook is never let a good crisis go to waste, right? So 
uh, they be, the bodies were not even cold before they were already pointing the finger at Ukraine, even though ISIS was over there going, no, it was us. It was us, guys. Hey, over <laughs> here. It was us. You know, but but Russia is like, yeah, shut up. It's not. No, it's the Ukrainians. It's the Ukrainians. Oh, the, I, these ISIS fighters must have come from Ukraine. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That that neo-Nazi uh, country that, that that hates anybody who's not white. What? Uh, you know, of course. It doesn't have to make sense because if Russia, first of all, there's there's no independent media. And so the Russians are only going to hear what the state controlled media puts out. And in many ways, the Russians, the Russian people desperately want this to be the fault of Ukraine so that it can they, they can say, ha, they've been saying we're so terrible for bombing civilians day after day after day for you know more than two years in Ukraine. Well, look what they're doing to civilians now. Um, but again, we it, it bears pointing out that so far there is no evidence that Ukraine has ever specifically targeted civilians who were not somehow connected to the, I mean, you know, there were, uh, there, there was a, the daughter of uh, Evgeny Prigozhin who was killed, uh, but they were actually sh- gunning for him, uh, right? The the Wagner chief. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is back at the beginning of the war, but you know, so they they I don't believe it was an intentional shooting a, a, a civilian, but they have they have not been intentionally bombing shopping centers and hospitals and schools and things inside of Russia. They the the drones that they've been sending into Russia have been hitting. Uh, power plants and fuel depots and arms caches and things like that. And uh, Russia, on the other hand, basically just aims its missiles at Ukraine. And uh, they either either they're fantastically incompetent at hitting what they're aiming at, or they are specifically aiming for civilian targets. And there's no two ways about it. I mean, I've been all over Ukraine during the war and it's hard to find a school that has not been bombed. Now, to be fair, Russian uh, military strategy is that when there's a war, schools become barracks for the soldiers. You send the kids home and you put soldiers in the barracks. And so they are making assumptions that Ukraine operates that way and they're bombing all the schools in Ukraine. Okay, so um, you know, it's not quite as evil as it sounds, but it's still, uh, and the kids are having not have not been in school because of that. They haven't been able to go to school. And the the upshot is that, you know, Russia has been killing hundreds and thousands of civilians uh, it, since the beginning of this war. I just saw a picture the other day that I took uh, in Lviv back at the beginning of the war, and they had 190 uh, strollers parked out on the pavement in the central square in Lviv. Uh, to signify 109 babies and toddlers that had been murdered by Russia back at the beginning. This is only a couple of months into the war. And now it's it's probably in the thousands that they've uh, of, of children that they've killed. So it's pretty rich for Russia to be screaming about how you know terrible and terroristic this is for uh, you know this again, again blaming it on Ukraine and saying that they're going after civilian targets in Russia when that's exactly what Russia has been doing since day one. So what can we expect, uh, by the way, if you're just joining us here now uh, on this live stream, CBN's Dan Andros here, joined by CBN's Chuck Holton, who's in Israel, talking about this uh, horrible, horrible mass attack in Russia outside of Moscow there at a concert venue. At least 130 have been killed. ISIS claimed responsibility for this, they said some suspects were arrested near the Ukrainian border. And as you were just talking about, Chuck, the U.S. Embassy in Russia said it was this was earlier this month, said they were monitoring reports that extremists have imminent plans to target large gatherings in Moscow, including at concerts. That's exactly what happened here. This is a concert venue, as we were saying, very similar, eerily similar to what happened in Israel. Just the difference was this one looks like is indoors at a venue there, while the obviously the uh, one in Israel is outside. Right. So, Chuck, what can we expect to see from the Biden administration uh, in the wake of this? Uh, likely, they're going to call for more gun control in the United States. That's typically their their first reaction, right? 
Um, they, Anthony Blinken has come out and said, we don't have any information that would show that this ties in any way to Ukraine. Uh, it is interesting to me that there was a white uh, like box van out that was parked out in front of the concert venue after the terror attack that had Ukrainian license plates on it. And on Russian telegram channels, they were making a really big deal out of that almost too big a deal, like one of those, I, you know, he does protest too much. Uh, but the, the, uh, Anton Gerashenko, who's a, a spokesperson for the Ukrainian government, pointed out something very interesting, that the license plate on the van from Ukraine, the, the, the Ukrainian license plate that was on the van was a type of license plate that Ukraine has not used for many, many years. It's, mm. a, it's a defunct type of license plate that was used back during the Soviet Union. And so uh, it almost appears that the, maybe the uh, FSB got the trundled out this van and parked it there so that they could point to it and try to point this back at Ukraine, which starts to you know raise suspicions that maybe it was a false flag event that the, the FSB. Now, I, I don't engage in conspiracy theories, and so I'm not going to go any further with that. I just found it very, very interesting that there would be a van parked out there with Ukrainian license plate, but the plates were something that the Ukraine has not issued in like a decade or more. Uh, and that that just makes you kind of scratch your head and go weird. The other thing I want to point out is that there, there are some videos po popping up on Telegram of the shooters that were um, captured. And these guys appear to be really bewildered. Uh, just watching them as they just like, it's like, where am I kind of look on their face. And it makes me uh, wonder, and I don't think it would be a surprise at all to find out that these guys had been hopped up on, uh, you know, drugs before they did that. ISIS is uh, very well known for using different kinds of drugs to get their soldiers all fired up and send them into battle. And uh, so it could be the case here as well. Yeah. And I mean, look, this is just the timing of it and the fact that it's in Russia and, you know, you've got everything going on with Ukraine and Russia. I mean, I think you're going to hear a lot of different theories. I, and people now, the trust in what they hear from these governments is at an all time low for every government, whether it's America, yeah. Ukraine, Russia. No one's going to believe basically anything that anyone says about it. So what do you think are what do you think are some of the things people should watch out for that maybe they shouldn't believe that they're going to. I mean, you're kind of talking about this one here, Russia trying to pin it on Ukraine. Is there anything else mm -hmm. like that that we can sort yeah, of I mean, expect I, to see and maybe watch out for? I, I think that the best way to approach any news item at this point is not to take the word of the government at face value, but to try to learn to read between the lines. And this this is what I do when I'm in a combat zone, you know, learning to to um, read the situation just by listening, by by seeing what's put out. Uh, you can get a better sense. It, it, this, it's just critical thinking is all it is. And uh, when if we think critically about this, first of all, I think we can pretty much rule out that it was a, an operation planned by Ukraine because for the reasons that I've already stated, and because if if Ukraine was planning it, the United States most likely would not be warning Russia about it, uh, that, that it was about to happen, right? Um, and as we think critically about these things, um, I think we have to take into account our own biases. I mean, check your premises, right? Uh, when If you're one of those people that is just vehemently against the war in Ukraine because we're spending money uh, you know, that we don't have and we shouldn't be giving money to Ukraine. Okay, I get it. But don't let that color how you interpret what you're seeing, uh, right? And and uh, so many people do that. I mean, I do these lives just about every day and I get, I see the comments just flying by, you know, there, there are too many to even try to refute, but some of them are just literally crazy. I mean, they're out there. Uh, I get emails from people on a daily basis that just made me go like, whew, holy cow, uh, right? These people are obviously not engaging in critical thinking. What they're engaging in is 
um, is the bias. They're, they're trying to feed their own biases. And if you're l watching the news, looking for a way to feed your own biases, you are going to get it wrong. It, you're not going to understand the reality of the situation in most cases. That's my two cents. Yeah, no, I think that's great. And I, look, I think it's one of the biggest problems we face right now, actually, is just a, a lack of critical think because people are frustrated. And so they let yeah. that frustration at some of the things happening kind of cloud uh, their analysis of a, of a particular situation. And you, you're probably going to land a lot of times, uh, at least I do, on, well, I guess I'm just not going to know the full answer. And yeah, or they they you know they just want to score points for their team, like well, like yeah. any what whatever um, interpretation that I'm going to land on for whatever just happened has to be one that scores points for my team. And if your if your first impre or your your first drive is to only score points for your team and not find the truth, you're going to be on the wrong side of the issue most likely. I mean, you're not going to understand the truth of the issue in some cases. Sometimes you might be yeah. right, but sometimes, you know, and, and boy, have I seen it since I moved out of the United States about 11, 12 years ago. Um, you know, I've come to see American culture from the outside in rather than from the inside out and seeing it through that those eyes through that lens. I start to understand that both sides in America desperately want to score points for their team to the exclusion even of the truth. And I don't want to I don't want to play that game. I don't want to yeah. do that. Nope. And as Christians, we we shouldn't we shouldn't want to play that game. We should just go wherever the truth uh, leads us. So I uh, appreciate you all, by the way, that are in the chat and that are engaging in this live stream. Dan Andros here, CBN's Chuck Olton here in Israel reacting to this terror attack in Russia. Don't forget while you're here, make sure if you haven't followed the channel, make sure you do that. It really it really helps us out when you're here on these live streams. It helps us keep Chuck out in the field and uh, right. people like him and like George Thomas and others who we have out here bringing you these reports, bringing you this analysis. Uh, it enables us to do that and keep you better informed. So make sure you like the stream, make sure you follow and you know you can click that whatever the notification bell thing, whatever they call it, but that will tell you um, when we go live and uh, we like Chuck said, he's doing that almost every day, multiple times a week. So uh, you can catch up with him there. And and we also go live uh, other times as well. So lots of information to bring you. Make sure you don't miss any of it. We really appreciate that. Uh, all right, Chuck. So a lot of people in the chat, I saw this one in the chat just asked, uh, I'm trying to see if I can find that one again. Somebody with the name Starburst Solaris here. Why attack innocent civilians? What's What's the reasoning here for uh, ISIS who's claiming responsibility for this? Well, I mean, that that is the purpose of terror. I mean, uh, you know, bringing terror uh, is their attempt to force the issue. OK, this is look, I mean, uh, to a different degree, this is exactly what happens when uh, whatever group that's protesting in the United States today goes out and stands in the middle of the road and blocks traffic okay right. it's, a, it's a difference of it's not a difference of type it's just a difference of uh, intensity so what i mean is uh, if you're punishing people who have nothing to do with the issue you're upset about then you are a terrorist whether you're shooting people in a concert venue or you're standing in the middle of the street keeping some joe from going to work both of those things qualify in my opinion as terrorism and uh, again, you're, it, it just comes down to trying to force a political issue uh, rather than go through the established means of political change, which are messy and complicated and take a long time and frustrating. I get it. But so some people just go, you know what, we're just going to conquer uh, you know, the, the world for our ideology by the sword. And you know, I, I talk a, when I speak at churches, I talk about this a lot, that uh, you can bring peace through the sword. And there are places in the Middle East that are peaceful, but they, they're still just riven with hate. So because you can have peace and you can all still hate each other. But that's the beautiful thing about Christ, about Christianity, is that Christ is a, a, a Christianity is a religion of love. And when you love your neighbor, 
it it drives out hate. You can't love your neighbor and hate him at the same time. And it's pretty darn hard for your neighbor to hate you when you love him. And so love conquers hate and drives it out. And then it you get peace in the bargain. Peace is a, a side benefit of, of that. And, you know, unfortunately, there is this group of people in the world they say it's maybe only about 2% of uh, total Muslims around, across the globe, but 2% of a billion people is a lot of people and that are extremist Muslims. And those extremist Muslims believe that they are doing the will of Allah when they murder civilians in a concert hall, and they are securing their place in heaven when they die by doing so. Because for them, like I said, it's all about dying the right way. And this is just one of the unfortunate things about living in a fallen world. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. And, um, you know, we got, it's, uh, you kind of touched on it, but uh, Kenneth in the chat was saying, Chuck, can you comprehend or understand all the hate in this world today since Biden took office? Now, I would argue that it's, it's a lot of it's been there since before Biden, but we, we have seen this sort of ramped up, um, I guess, uh, a military action. I mean, this is a terror attack. Um, I mean, the one in yes. Israel, of course, was obviously coordinated in large part by Iran. So you see this aggression, and of course, Russia into Ukraine since Biden took office. So, mm -hmm. so what do you what do you make of that? Well, I mean, you could pretty easily make the case that if the United States had not precipitously pulled out of Afghanistan and projecting pro projected weakness in the process, that. Russia would not have invaded Ukraine, that uh, this terror attack wouldn't have happened, and many other terror attacks wouldn't have happened. Uh, because, like I say, when we project weakness as uh, the United States on the world stage, we embolden our adversaries and we, we betray our, our allies. And whenever we do that, the United States shrinks on the world stage. We have less power. We have less prestige. We have less a pull to get things done in the world because we're not setting the rules anymore. We're, we're stepping back off the world stage. And when we step back, we create a vacuum into which Russia and China and Iran uh, are, are glad to take our place. And this is what happens in a world where Russia and China and Iran are making the rules. That's all. Yeah, indeed. And I just want can, to thank uh, Holly. Can you hear uh, fighter jet going by, by the way? I, well, I don't have my earpiece in, so I can't hear that. Oh. But yeah, there are fighter jets going on the way to uh, Lebanon right now, going right wow. overhead. Yeah, and in case you missed it, I mean, just uh, Chuck uh, George was—I uh, think you saw this, Chuck. But George, uh, we were talking to him in southern Lebanon just earlier mm -hmm. this week, and uh, he and the, his cameraman got incredible footage. He's—he's he's in a dangerous area. He's not far from the Hezbollah yeah. strongholds there, and. You, he, he was caught right in the middle of a rocket volley of a Hezbollah rocket that went over and then Israel was responding back. And you see all these this happen. And it's just in these villages in in southern Lebanon. Just absolutely. Yeah, I just came today from I was literally within uh, like a kilometer and a half from the border with Lebanon. And I practically could have waved at George where he was on the other side uh, be, between the two of us was probably eight kilometers or something like that. He was very close to to me, uh, from from what I understand of his location. So yeah, yeah, uh, we we saw it from our our side. That's amazing. Yeah. So obviously that's uh, ramping up over there uh, as well, and you can expect more from Chuck on that front coming up here in the coming days. Uh, just wanted to thank Holly there for the super chat in there. That's of course something you can do. I want to remind people, Chuck, because I see people do this all the time when they when they donate the super chat, uh, which is great. We're so thankful for that. You, one of the things that's great is, you know, you got all these people, you got thousands of people in these chats. If you leave a comment, it's going to stay up there. So if you really want your comment seen and you want everyone to uh, check it out, uh, you don't, I mean, appreciate the donation without the comment. I'm just saying that's a right, side right, benefit. Yeah. You could, you can and get you don't your have benefit. to give a hundred dollars. You can give, give, you know, 99 cents and get your comment seen better yeah. that way. But uh, yeah, I know people do that a lot of my, my life uh, over on the hot zone. So um, yeah, yeah, we do. We certainly do appreciate it. And again, if you want a tax deduction for your donation to support CBN, you can go to CBN.com and donate over there. 
Yes. That's actually the better way to do it. The YouTube way is yeah. uh, because they do take a percentage, a little bit of that, and that's fine. They're providing the platform, so that's just the cost of doing business. But right. it, it's easier this way. I mean, you know, it's the it's the path of least resistance. So whatever, whatever helps you out. But yeah, CBN, okay. going over to CBN.com is a great way to do that. So Chuck, uh, I know you got to get going here. It's getting late over there. Any final thoughts you want to leave people with here on the stream today about what we saw happen here in Russia? Well, I mean, I think that we need to be praying for the families of these people. We need to pray for the evil that that my my prayer is always that God would thwart the plans of evil men and wherever they are, whatever they're doing um, these look, uh, my family was directly impacted by a mass shooting like this back in the 1990s in Fort Worth, Texas. My father was a pastor at a big Baptist church in Fort Worth, and they had a gunman come in and killed nine people. And my dad, he shot right at my dad, directly at my dad, and just missed him uh, twice. And so, uh, you know, this this kind of thing really strikes home for me every time I see it. And uh, folks, we need to be prepared. We need to be, you know, thinking about how, you know, when, when you're out in public, uh, thinking about the possibility of what, what, what would I do if something happened? There are some very good resources that we've talked about a lot on my channel and on this channel. Uh, I've had Tim Miller on with me a lot uh, talking about how to be prepared for those things if and when they happen. But the bottom line is we don't need to live in fear. Um, you know, God, uh, it says in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 7, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And, you know, knowledge is power. The more we understand about uh, the more we're trained ourselves and the more that we prepare ourselves for a potential crisis, the the less fear we're going to have about going out into the world because we're going to know what to do if something happens. That's that's the knowledge. Uh, the knowledge is power, right? Um, love. I mean, when when I am more focused on the people that I love rather than the people who that I'm focusing on, the people who might hate me, uh, then I'm going to be more bold to go out into the world and to try to help other people even in the midst of crisis. And that self-discipline that always comes into handy so that I try to keep my body uh, physically and mentally strong, uh, try to you know, stay in the word and, and be spiritually fit uh, so that when the crisis comes, I'm not going to have a breakdown because I'm trusting in the Lord. All three of those things drive out fear and I don't have to be afraid. I don't feel fear when I'm in a combat zone. I don't feel fear when the bullets are flying. And I haven't for decades because I practice those three things. And I would encourage you all to do the same. That's fantastic. And, uh, you know, it, it reminds me of a, you know, you telling the story of your father there, Chuck. It, it reminds me of another uh, video I saw of a gentleman who was on, a, I think, like a city council or something like that. And a guy came in uh, with a gun and was mad at the city council. And he, he was 10 feet away from this guy, aimed right at him and missed. And they were interviewing this guy. Uh, he was apprehended after that. So they were interviewing this councilman who had a near miss. The bullet was right by his head. And he was a Christian. And he and they asked him and they said, well, what did you feel in that situation? How, you know, how afraid were you? And he said, you know, I, I wasn't afraid. And he said, it's because you can't threaten me with heaven. And I yeah. just thought. Man, like I wish I had Elon that eternal Musk perspective with, with the barrel of the gun. Away. I mean, you, you, you're like threatening Elon Musk with giving him some more money or something. It's like, wait, right. you know, what? Yeah, <laughs> right. Not that we not that we want to intentionally die, but well, like to your point about not living with fear, we know what awaits us on the other side. Uh, and so, you know, in a situation like that, unfortunately, I think we all have to have that mindset now. You know, I know you do a lot of work with this, Chuck, helping people get prepared for that at churches and elsewhere. Like we were talking about with the border situation going on, unfortunately, it's the reality we we face today. Yeah, it is. It is so, and that it is unfortunate. But uh, again, this is our time. It's an opportunity for believers to show the world. Because look, if you're just as afraid as everybody else, then you've got nothing to offer. Yeah. But, but being fearless, I mean, I I did write a whole book about this. It's called Bulletproof. You can check it out on Amazon if you want to buy it. But uh, the, you know, the, the whole purpose of uh, the living the Christian life out loud is that I, I am, uh, people see the fact 
that I'm not afraid. People see the fact that we are fearless, that we can go into, that we're prepared for things when they happen. And they, they say, I want that. I, I don't want to be afraid anymore. And, and so this is why we stay in the word. We, we practice those three things. Uh, God has not given us a spirit of, of timidity or cowardice, but of power and of love and a sound mind. So we, we just practice those three things. Amen. Well, Chuck, I know on your streams, you normally close out with prayer. So uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if we want to keep the streak let's going here. And, and uh, if you want to close this out, let's do it. Absolutely. Father God, we come to you today and we are just heartbroken for the families who have lost loved ones in this most recent attack. We're more heartbroken because there are people out there who think this is the way to accomplish their own will here on this earth just by murdering innocents. Father, we pray that you would send your angels to thwart the plans of evil men. We pray that you would enable those who are standing up against the darkness to do what is necessary to understand. You'd give them wisdom and discernment uh, so that they could do a better job of thwarting these evil plans wherever they are. We pray your protection over the United States of America, Lord, is that we know that there are people planning violent events like this even now as I speak. We pray for the people here in Israel as well, Lord, and they've already been subjected to this terrible event, but we know that you are a powerful enough God that you could have stopped it, but you're even more powerful than that. You could take it and turn it into something that glorifies you, turn it into something that is actually something people can be thankful for sometime down the road. We don't know how that works, we don't know how you do that. We just know that you are a powerful enough God to do it, Lord. And so we pray that you would cause people to turn to you through the tragedies they, that they face and they would find you, you would be their God and you would give them that peace that passes all understanding. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, Chuck, appreciate your time. Stay safe over there, brother. And okay. uh, we will, uh, we'll see you back on here again soon. All right, we'll see you. Take care. All right, God bless everyone.